I wanted to make tonight special, I said, gently placing the towel-covered box on the coffee table. Liz's eyes lit up and a mischievous smile curled over her lips. Oh no, what'd you get? I racked my brain to figure out the perfect gift, I said, looping my arm around her waist. It had to be an enduring symbol of our love. Chocolates are digested quickly. Flowers wither and die over a course of a week. They wouldn't suffice. You sure know how to build up the reveal, she said, inching closer. I released her with a dramatic flourish and swiftly yanked the towel off the box, revealing a ten-gallon aquarium. Liz leaned in for a look. You got me a fish? But there's no water. Not fish, I said. Crabs. Two hermit crabs. Before us were two of the most adorable crustaceans imaginable. Both of them had a pair of black dotted eyes, miniature red pincers, and a colorful spiked shell. Liz gasped and placed her hand in front of her mouth. Oh my god, they're cuter than baby Yoda cuddling a kitten. I love them. She gave me an emphatic kiss on the lips, and I felt all my pent-up tension finally loosen. So glad. I wasn't sure how it would go, and oh shit. I dashed into the kitchen and found the pasta boiling over. I lifted the pot off the burner and spilled hot foam onto the stove. It's okay, I shouted. Just a little mess. I picked up the wooden spoon and gave the bologna sauce a quick stir. Also, uh, spaghetti is just about ready. As I dumped the noodles into the sink, I looked out the kitchen window and watched as violent howling winds swept out large snowflakes into a never-ending dance. It was a real blizzard out there, fiercer than anything I'd seen in a long while. I walked back to the living room and found Liz up to her elbows in the crab tank. Good thing we're not going out tonight, I said. Really crazy weather out there. All of a sudden, Liz withdrew her hand and hollered, God damn, that hurt! Little bastard got me! What happened? Those little pincers! They don't look like much, but they are sharp! She held up her index finger, and a red spot of blood began to bead. What were you trying to do? I asked. Pick one up? She pinched her lips, looking sheepish. No, I was trying to see if Weeboo's shell came off like a suit. I put on my serious face. First, do not remove their shells. They're not wearing suits. They're, they really don't like being naked. And secondly, Weeboo? I grinned. Is that what you named one? She nodded. That's a nice name. What are you going to call the other one? She concentrated and hummed. What about Lenny Kravitz? I laughed. And I gave her a big hug. I feel like you've been waiting for this opportunity. But wash your crab wound and come eat. Supper's ready. Soon after, we both sat down at the kitchen table. You went all out this time, Liz said, motioning towards the floral patterned cloth, the folded napkins, and the slender white candle erected in the middle of the table. I sparked a match and held it against the candle's wick until it lit. At the same time, a strong gust of wind shook the house, causing the power to flicker. I'm so glad I bought the candles, I said. I wouldn't be surprised if we lost power tonight. It wouldn't be so bad. Liz said, spiraling a spool of tomato-smeared noodles onto her fork. We've got enough blankets to keep us warm and enough spaghetti to last us a month. Yeah, I did make a lot of food, I said. Also, there's cake. We chowed down. I popped open a $12 bottle of rosé and poured both of us large glasses. Soon, I was more than a little tipsy when out of the corner of my eye, I saw a tiny creature inching its way towards us. Is that one of the crabs? I asked. How did it get out? I pushed out my chair, rubbing my distended belly, and walked towards it. Which one is it? Liz asked. Is it Weeboo or Lenny? I leaned over the crab and, mindful of the pincers, carefully picked it up in the palm of my hand. It had a spiked yellow shell and protested with a high-pitched ch 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 How do you get out, little guy? I carefully carried him back to the living room and its aquarium home. There you go, I said but abruptly froze. There were already two hermit crabs inside the tank. Well, that's weird, I thought. Hey, Liz? You're not going to believe this, but we have an extra hermit crab. More is always better, she called back. And where's the cake? I mean, seriously, come, come here. We both hovered over the aquarium, utterly perplexed. You sure you didn't buy three? She asked. No, I only bought two, I protested. No, maybe one latched onto another, and when you thought you picked up one, you really picked up a conjoined pair. Sounds like a good deal. Sure, 
I said, not completely convinced. We stood by as the three crabs scurried about the confines of their glass-enclosed home. I returned to the kitchen, opened the fridge, and cut the cake into several uniform pieces. I brought the candle and two plates of cake back to the living room where I found Liz already preparing the couch for the movie. While she fussed with the blankets and pillows, I loaded a bootleg copy of Parasite. About ten minutes into the movie, there was a terrible banshee howl of wind, and the house shook violently, and seconds later, the power went out. Oh, shit, I said. I was really looking forward to this movie. Whatever. Liz turned on her cell phone flashlight. Let's make the best of the situation. Why don't you start a fire while I get us some wine? That's a great idea, I said. And you wonder why I keep you around. I picked up the candle and took it over to the fireplace. I already had a bundle of freshly chopped wood in place and crumpled balls of newspaper enclosed underneath. I stuck the candle into the fireplace, illuminating it with a wavering yellow glow. However, just before the newspaper could ignite, I saw something tiny moving from within. I shifted the candle towards the object and, and I discovered yet another hermit crab. Hey, Liz, I called out. I found another hermit crab. You're so funny, I heard a response in the kitchen. I took the logs out of the fireplace and scrutinized the insides. And to my surprise, I found out that the crab was not alone. In the fireplace were three more tiny critters, all milling about in the ashes. One of them raised up their minuscule legs and expressed an adorable ch 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 No, come here. I'm not kidding. Liz slid up alongside me with two full glasses in hand. We both peered into the fireplace. What the hell? She said, grinning. What kind of game are you playing, mister? I'm, I'm not playing, I swear. This is getting weird. Just then I was interrupted by the pitter-patter sound of something small and hard bouncing its way down the chimney. It landed before us in a puff of ash. It was another hermit crab. Liz stopped smiling. So you're not doing this, right? No. No, of course not. Why? Suddenly there was a jarring clatter coming from the roof. We both froze and listened. Then from above our heads came a prolonged creak, like, like someone was placing weight on old floorboards. It was followed by evenly spaced thumps that charted a path along our ceiling. Was that wind or footsteps? Liz asked, her voice tinged with concern. I have no idea, I said. Want to go look? Not really, she shrugged. It's freaking cold out there, and besides, we're not going to see much with that candle. One second, I said, stumbling into the darkness. I outstretched my arms and groped for a familiar terrain. When I stubbed my toe on a table, I knew I was getting close. Soon I found what I was looking for, a high-powered mag light. I turned it on and blinded myself. I went back to Liz. Come on, let's put on our boots and jackets. This is when you offer to let me stay inside in the warm house while you brave the elements, right? She said hopefully. I was afraid to admit that I didn't want to go out there alone. Instead, I said, oh, come on. It'll just be for a moment. Aren't you curious about all those damn hermit crabs? As if to punctuate my words with foreboding, the wind howled menacingly and the walls trembled against the onslaught. She scrunched up her face in disappointment and continued zipping up her jacket. All suited up, I eased open the front door and we both shielded our eyes from the immediate gust of frozen particulate. Together, we shuffled across the frigid front porch and onto the snow-covered front yard. I scanned the horizon with my flashlight and was met with an impenetrable whiteout. None of the homes which lined the cul-de-sac were visible through the icy tempest, and with the power out, the streetlights were black and lifeless. We were standing in the center of our front yard when I raised the flashlight towards the roof and shone it in the direction of our chimney. Liz gasped and dropped the light in surprise. The hell was that? She exclaimed. I fumbled with the flashlight and then aimed it back towards the roof. Despite the blizzard, there was no doubt about what we were looking at. Hanging onto the chimney, 20 feet above us, was an unmistakable form of a man. Holy shit. There's someone up there, I said, pausing for a moment while I focused on the more striking features of the stranger. What is he wearing? Liz, hiding behind me, peeked out. Nothing? She was right. Except for a large burlap sack he held onto, the man appeared to be completely naked. What's he doing up there? I asked, transfixed by the spectacle. 
We watched as he reached his arm into the bag, then pulled out something that was round and small, and proceeded to drop it into our chimney. So, that explains the hermit crabs, I said. Liz began pacing in the snow, becoming frantic. That guy is going to freeze to death up there. We gotta do something, right? What are we gonna do? I stepped forward and shouted, Hey! Uh, what are you doing up there? The man did not respond, and with the din of the storm, I doubted he could hear me. Instead, he once more reached into his large sack and deposited another hermit crab into our chimney. I inhaled deeply, the cold air coating my lungs, and called out again, Hey! You can't be up there! What the hell are you doing? Liz joined me, shouting, You're gonna freeze to death, you crazy idiot! She clung to me, and I could feel her body trembling, but I wasn't sure if it was from the cold or, or something else. I'm gonna call the police. I handed Liz the flashlight, took off my gloves, and grabbed my phone out of my pocket. Unfortunately, when I tried to dial 911, my hands were too numb to operate the phone. I breathed warm air into my cupped hands, to no effect. Okay, this isn't working. I'm gonna run inside real quick, make this call, stay here and watch this guy, alright? I'll be right back. What? You want me to stay out here? She blurted, clearly not happy with the prospect of being left alone. It'll just be a moment, I promise. I kissed her on the top of her torque-encased head and ran back toward the front door, leaving deep, foot-shaped impressions in the snow. Before entering, I turned around and saw Liz standing rigid and pointing the flashlight towards the roof. I'll be quick, I shouted. If she heard me, she didn't react. As soon as I was inside, I ripped off my gloves and I planted my hands under my armpits in an attempt to revive them. Then I turned on my cell phone and dialed the police. No signal. I waved the phone around wildly in the air, hoping that this would gesture some kind of encouragement towards my phone to connect to a nearby tower. Shit, shit, I cursed in machine gun in succession. I had to use the landline, but it was across the house, deep in the dark bowels of the living room. I turned on my cell flashlight and stole my winter boots, stomped a wet path across the carpet. Just before reaching the phone, I stepped forward and heard a loud crunch. I stopped and aimed the light towards the ground and found that beneath my thick rubber heel, I had crushed a hermit crab. I panned the light towards the ground in front of me and found nearly a dozen hermit crabs, all scurrying in different directions. I carefully navigated around them and picked up the phone. There was no dial tone. I tried 911, but the effort was in vain. The house phone was just as useless as my cell. Just great, I mumbled. Mindful of the minefield of crabs, I ran back to the front door and returned to the snowy maelstrom outside. Liz, I can't get a signal! Liz? I scanned the front yard, but she wasn't there. A beam of light shone like a pillar from where I had last seen her. Liz! I shouted. Where are you? I trudged through the snow toward the light. I bent over and found the mag light. A thin blanket of snow already covering it. Liz! I called again. No response. I picked up the flashlight and lit the area around me. No Liz. Then I aimed the flashlight towards the roof and found the naked man was gone. All that remained was the large brown sack. What the hell? I shouted. This wasn't like Liz. Her wandering off into the dark snowstorm was not an idea I could readily contemplate. Liz! I shouted again and again. I spun around in a circle, trying to see through the blizzard, but her familiar shape was absent. My throat grew hoarse. I fell to my knees in a coughing fit. And that's when I found, arrayed in the ground around me, a series of Liz-sized footprints, all chaotically mingled together and quickly filling with snow. These would tell me where she went, I thought. I saw that most of the prints were centered in a clump in the front lawn where Liz and I first saw the man on the roof. I, I scanned the periphery of the yard, looking for more steps that led away from the center. Success! I found a single set of footprints sunk deep in the snow. I followed them as they snaked their way towards the side of the house. That's when I discovered a long metal ladder resting against the side of the house. It must have been the means by which the naked man climbed up on the roof. The footprints stopped at the ladder base. Did Liz go up the ladder, I wondered? No, I, I couldn't imagine that. However, the evidence suggested otherwise. If those were her prints, then clearly she climbed up. Where else could she have gone? I knew that I had to ascend the ladder, but my heart pounded so hard I was getting dizzy. I didn't want to go up there in the darkness, buffeted by violent winds and pelted by snow, only to get greeted by some deranged naked man. I placed my foot on the lowest rung, clenched my teeth, and commenced the climb. I made slow progress. It felt like the wind chill flashed before my eyes. Every few feet, my clumsy boots would slip and I would fall back to the previous step. 
After what seemed like a frozen eternity, I reached the top of the ladder and holding on for dear life, I gingerly crawled off onto the roof. While this particular section was flat, I did not feel safe up here. Up here, the wind was even more relentless, buffeted me on all sides of the barrage of icy slaps. Mindful of the ice and the elevation, I stepped towards the chimney and inspected the area with my flashlight. There was zero signs of Liz. Around the base of the chimney, I found where the snow was disturbed by the naked man. There I found his large brown sack, the same one we saw him reach into. I inched closer, trying not to slip, and picked up the bag. I held it at arm's length like a used diaper. Then I turned it over and dumped out the contents. Dozens of hermit crabs came tumbling out. There was no doubt now the naked man was dropping hermit crabs down our chimney. The question of why, however, was still a mystery, and I was still no closer to finding Liz. Liz, where the hell are you? I backed away from the chimney towards the edge of the roof. From this vantage point, I should have been able to see all around me for miles, but instead, I was enclosed by an opaque white dome. Once more, I shouted, Liz! at the top of my lungs, but my words were eaten by the maelstrom of wind and snow. I sensed movement from the corner of my eye. I spun around just in time to watch the top of the ladder disappear off the edge of the roof. Oh, fuck. I exclaimed. I ran back towards the descending ladder. In my haste, my feet lost traction. I ended up slipping on the ice, precariously close to the eave throwing. On my hands and knees, I crawled towards the roof's edge. I glanced down towards the ground and found the naked man placing the ladder on the ground. Son of a bitch! Put the ladder back up! I shouted. I watched helplessly as he disappeared into the backyard. And now I was truly screwed. I had to get down without the ladder and without badly injuring myself. I was at least 20 feet off the ground, high enough that I could, I could guarantee an injury if I landed wrong. Peering over the edge, I was jolted by a terrified scream coming from beneath me. Stay away! Stop! Put that down! Ah! It was Liz. It sounded like it was coming from back inside our home. Her shouting was followed by the bang of a door slam and the violent crash of dishes. And then abruptly, the commotion stopped. Liz is in danger. I have to act now. I, I scanned frantically for the best spot to land. Is that, is that a snowbank? I wondered. Below me were a series of bushes encroached with the snow. I was about to hurl myself off the roof when I was struck by a crucial question. Were the bushes surrounded by ornate spikes? As I reflected, I realized there was plenty of very pointed objects down there on the ground, all obscured by snow and all ready to pierce my skin and organs on impact. From inside the house, I heard another scream and I lost all self-control. I flung myself off the roof and, as expected, landed hard. I must have smashed my head because I blacked out on impact. I don't know how long I was out for, but I, it was long enough for the wind and falling snow to largely subside. As I groggily regained consciousness, I was greeted by severe pain in my ankle. I couldn't tell through my snow boots whether it was sprained or broken, but given the unnatural position it rested, it was safe to assume the latter. I tried to get up onto my feet, but I was so overcome with pain and dizziness I collapsed back onto my face. Thoughts of Liz soon entered my addled brain, and I remembered that I had to get into the house and save her. Once more, adrenaline surged through my body and numbed some of the pain as I reached out my gloved hand and dragged myself towards the front door. It was slow going, and my leg protested every inch of progress, but finally, I made it to the porch. I could see that the front door was partially ajar as a sliver of light shone from the frame. I drew closer and extended my arm towards the door handle when it slammed shut, followed by the click of a deadbolt. Sh shit! I cursed, wrenching futilely on the now locked knob. I knew more than anything I needed to get inside and help Liz. I'll break through the window, I thought. I found an empty flower pot and hurled it towards the front window. Sadly, the flower pot shattered on impact while the window remained firmly under a spiderweb of glass. I took a hold of another flower pot and discovered that with my injuries, I could barely lift it off the ground. My head started throbbing and I fell to the floor. What was I expecting to do when I got inside anyway? Fight off the naked man? I wondered. I couldn't even stand on my own two feet, let alone stand up to an intruder. I needed another plan. Then it struck me. The neighbors. Someone had to be home. On a nice day, it was only a short walk to the next house over. However, now through an ocean of accumulated snow and ice, it would certainly be a long, painful hobble, but still, it was a plan. I gritted my teeth and I started towards the next house. I dragged myself down the driveway, leaving a fissure in the snow like a plowed field. 
I stopped at the curb to catch my breath. And that's when I noticed something directly in front of me. Something small, slowly inching a steady path across the snow-covered cul-de-sac. Must be another hermit crab, I thought. As I drew closer, I realized that crabs didn't have the same type of shell as Weeaboo and, and Lenny. In fact, it wasn't a shell at all. Rather, the critter was encased in what looked like a hunk of raw steak. I backed away. I tried not to vomit. Then I noticed a long crimson snail trail of blood and viscera that followed in its wake. That final discovery was too much. I, I turned my face to the snow and I retched. The critter issued a chit 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 sound in protest and continued on its way. After avoiding most of that evening's spaghetti, I, I soon realized that the abomination before me wasn't the only gore-encased crab. My hand shaking, I panned the flashlight across the cul-de-sac, revealing many more, each ponderously crossing the snow and coloring the road red like a team of disgusting meat crayons. They all seemed to be heading towards the center of the cul-de-sac. Their, their passage marked the snow like unsettling spokes on a wheel. I tried to put aside the visual atrocity and continued trudging through the snow until I arrived at the end of my neighbor's driveway. Almost there, I assured myself. Soon I was on their front porch and just about to knock on the door when I heard screams and clatters of violent struggle coming from inside. I eased my fist away from the door. Not too late. I backed away from the door and I saw movement from above me. I glanced up towards the house on the left and I saw the naked man on the roof. Once more he was straddling the chimney with a not another large brown sack. My god, there's more of them. My mind reeled at the implication. My neighborhood was under assault by deranged hermit crab wielding nudists. One lunatic I could handle. A pack of these unattired psychopaths was too much to contemplate. I collapsed onto my neighbor's steps, pondering my next move. The phones were dead. It was an immediate danger. The neighbors were being terrorized, and I was too injured to make a getaway. I glanced back towards my home, and I saw the impressions of my car under a blanket of snow. That's it, I thought. I'd drive to safety, but how would I How would I start the damn thing? I realized that I always kept a set of keys in my jacket. With frozen hands, I patted myself down and fished my stiff fingers into my jacket pocket. Success. I pulled out a pair of keys. Now for the long journey there. Once more, I dragged myself back to my property, doing my best to navigate around a dozen of blood-soaked crab lines. All around me, I was ringed with the muffled screams and calls for help coming from inside the surrounding homes. I had to ignore these cries, I told myself. Exhausted, I arrived beside my car. Using my arms as a brush, I wiped away a sizable chunk of snow off the side of the car, and then I, I wrenched open the driver's side door. Wincing from the effort, I pulled myself into the car and slammed the door shut behind me. Inside, I relished on the silence because I could no longer hear my neighbors pleading in desperate agony. Now all I wanted to do was close my eyes and let the spinning world settle for just, just one moment. But I knew that I had to move. I turned the key in the ignition, and the car rumbled as it came to life. I turned on the windshield wipers and revealed a gap in the snow. As soon as I turned on the high beams, I discovered I was not alone. Between the car and the garage door stood Liz. I opened the car window and leaned out. Liz! Oh my god, get in the car now! We need to get out of here! She didn't respond. Instead, she just... She just stood there motionless. Liz! Did you hear me? The more I looked at Liz, the clearer it became that something was severely wrong with her. For one, she seemed to be considerably shorter than before. She was no longer wearing a jacket, revealing an excess of skin that sat loosely on her frame. I looked into her eyes and saw that her face was a horror story that hung like a like a deflated balloon, and when she turned her head to look at me, her visage was as expressive as a hand puppet. Liz? I repeated. She abruptly tilted her head and made a sound that was both familiar and disgusting. Ch -ch 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 -ch. I couldn't believe it. It wasn't Liz. It was a, a goddamn hermit crab wearing Liz like a like an ill-fitting human skin coat. I, I panicked. I put the car into drive and floored the accelerator, slamming the creature into the garage door. On impact, I smashed my head on the steering wheel, and once again, everything went dark. 
Much later, I was awoken to a tapping on my car window. I opened the door and I felt a pair of meaty hands drag me out. Oh no, I thought, this is it. What are they going to do to me? I struggled to open my eyes and as they reluctantly adjusted to the sunlight. Before me wasn't a naked man, but a uniformed police officer. What happened? I stammered. The cop threw me onto the hood of my car, jerked my arms around my back, and handcuffed me. Sir, you tell me. And then I saw her. I barely registered the cop was reading my Miranda rights. Instead, I focused upon the horror that was sandwiched in front of me. Crushed under the crumpled front end of my car was the empty sheath of my wife's skin. She looked like a sock without a foot. Just an empty, lifeless flesh casing. She reminded me of a sausage with the meat removed. There was a hole in her chest where it looked like something had crawled out and discarded her body like a candy wrapper or or an old shell. I started thrashing on the ruined hood of my car. My mind was gone. It was blown away in the blizzard, never to return. It was Weeaboo and Lenny Kravitz, I cried. I gave her crabs. They took her off like a suit. Like a goddamn suit. Hey there, kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I just want to make sure that all of you guys are still staying safe and doing your best to stay inside and keep yourself quarantined if you can do so. For those of you who can't, really appreciate you guys doing what you, you know, have to do. So, all the best to all of you who are still working, and all the best to all of you who are forced to kind of stay home and are not able to work. If you guys are missing out on a lot of the conventions, which at this point, all of them that I was planning on going to this year, with the exception of San Japan, uh, looks like have been either cancelled or pushed back. If you guys were looking forward to any of the conventions this year and are missing out on a lot of the artwork from some of your favorite authors or artists, take a look in the description down below. At least until the quarantine is over, you'll be able to find links to a bunch of my artist friends as well as authors uh, in the description of every video. And of course, I will be bringing you guys stories every single day from now until the end of time, available here on YouTube as well as here on the podcast on Spotify, Apple, iTunes and Google and wherever else you can get podcasts. And now a very special thank you, big thank you, the biggest thank you I can possibly give to all of you who support on patreon.com slash Mr. Creepypasta, who help keep the lights on in my house. Patreons such as Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Ken Lando Higuchi, Brianna Ventine Jensen, Chompinski, The Red Oak Shield Virus, Sandy Barney, G. Weevil 3, Diana Krauss, Stephen Van Huss, Tristan Pelton, Nico Cow, The Ginger Bros, Dante Rao, Rafael Rodriguez, Last Blade Song, Eliminator 86, Nebsky, Steampunk Sinner, Caleb Dougal, Daniel Paulson, Sky Harbor, The Homeless Bird 93, Gabrielle Undefined, Barbie Carmen, Liam Newman, Aaron Stormcrow, Dr. Strawberry, Barbara Masio, Thomas Burgett, Azazel Rotten, Let's Get Scared, S-Man, Brandy Hasanori, and King DDD. Thank you guys so much for supporting on Patreon, as well as all of you that are shown in the description down below. And sweet dreams, everyone. <laughs>